So thank you. It's, it's a real pleasure to be here, and I want to thank Laura, who's moved away from there, uh, for inviting me to speak uh, at, this, at this event. Uh, the topic obviously could not be more topical and, and important, not just for those of you here, but for, for the global economy as a whole. Uh, so it was uh, quite a pleasure to sit and think about this. Um, so when we think about globalization, what we've experienced, and this is very important to keep in mind, is that we've had 60 years post-World War II. We've had 60 years of increasing globalization. Uh, it's, you know, the world came to accept, countries came to accept the fact that globalization was necessary for growth. Uh, and they came to accept the fact that there were many virtues to globalization. And though there was some cost to it, there was no question of going back, because this was the thing to do, like vaccination. It kind of came to be accepted as a thing that countries do, uh, and, and globalization is here to stay. And of course, you know, after 10 years of a global financial crisis, uh, it's not surprising that this has taken, uh, this line of thinking has taken a hit, uh, and you've seen some very populist revolts. I mean, some of the big ones that we have is the US election, uh, with uh, Trump's election, this other big event was Brexit, uh, Britain deciding to exit the European Union. So these are big events, but this is a part of an ongoing uh, populist revolt that's happening in many parts of the world. It's coming from the far right, it's coming from the far left, and it's coming from everywhere. So this is a very important point to stop and uh, question whether globalization is in retreat, what are the threats to globalization, what do we see will happen in the next, not just 13 years, but in the next 20 years, 25 years? Where do we think globalization is going to go? And what does this mean for those of you in the room here? And I think with the world economy about economic integration, about economic trade, uh, about growing the production network uh, of the world. So here's my plan. My plan is that it's kind of hard to talk about the future without first talking about the past a little bit. So I'm going to start by talking about the recent past, and I'm going to talk about the recent past and now. Uh, and as you will see, that will give you some insight into where we think that the world economy is headed. And then I'm going to launch into trade and I'm going to, and for the future. So I'm going to talk about what the future has in store. Uh, and then I'm going to talk about two countries that I think are quite important to the future of the world economy, and that's China and India, um, and how you know, their growth plays into these questions about greater economic integration, more trade, um, and you know, general prosperity and welfare in, in, in the world. OK, so that's, so that's the plan. So let's start with the very first thing, which is trade in the recent past. OK, so the decade of the 1990s, and I'm going to come back to this again after a few more slides, but this is something you should know. The 1990s was special in many ways. Okay? Uh, and the 1990s was also when you had major growth in world trade, uh, major growth in global supply chains, and three factors drove it. Okay, so the first is the information and communication technology revolution. I want to tell you more about that. We've just had many sessions on it. That continues. But the, the pace of it was really phenomenal in the 1990s, and it was a big driver of world productivity growth. And that fed into growing global supply chains. The second was falling trade costs. So when you think about globalization and you think of bringing countries together, it's very important that trade becomes cheaper. Now, trade becomes cheaper in two ways. One, because countries agree to trade with each other. So we had immense amount of trade liberalization. And transportation costs fell by a lot in the 1990s. So that was a second factor. The third is favorable political developments. So we had the fall of communism. We had a general acceptance of globalization in many countries in the world, you know, with China entering the WTO, with, uh, you know, with uh, moving away towards, with China moving away towards a market economy, with the unification of East and West Germany. So the world kind of moved towards, uh, uh, towards uh, the view that greater economic integration was great for the, for the world economy and for their individual countries. So those three factors, and we're going to come back to it to just to think about how these factors look uh, now when we try to predict into the future, uh, 
where things are going to go. But those three factors were crucial for bringing about a boom in trade and global supply chains. So let's just look at some of the uh, just facts over there. Those are on the chart. You see about 50 years since the formation of the GATT, which was the General Agreement on Tariffs and, and Trade, Trade and Tariffs. Uh, we had a decline in average world tariff rates by about, you know, from 13% to 9%, so about 4 percentage points. And then you had another big decline in a much shorter period of time in the 1990s and early 2000s. And now the global tariff rate, world average global tariff rate is down to around 4%, in fact, slightly below 4% at this point. So this is important to keep in mind, which is to say that in terms of some parameters, like average tariff rates, we're already pretty close to you know, the optimal level of globalization. There's not that much more space left to go. The other thing that you see there in the 1990s is this proliferation of regional trade agreements, which are kind of the gray uh, bars that you see over there. Uh, you had many things happen. Of course, some of the biggest events was in 1993, the single uh, market for the European Union. You had NAFTA in 1994, but then you had Mercosur in Latin America. You had the ASEAN trade agreements. You had China joining the WTO in 2000. So these were all many important trade liberalization episodes that happened during the 1990s and early 2000s, which is, explains why we are in this situation where we're pretty close to uh, a very liberalized uh, trade. Uh, and so again, now we have to think about how this is going to look in the future. Uh, and this chart over here is a measure of world trade intensity, which is simply you sum up world imports and exports and you divide that by world GDP. I mean, that's what world trade intensity is. I want you to just focus on the kind of the period between 1986 and 07, so that's the period kind of covers mostly the 1990s. Uh, you have that the average growth in trade intensity was 3.4% per year, okay? So which means that trade was growing at a faster rate than world GDP was growing at. So this is, again, the booming years of world trade. Uh, and you can see that it contrasts with the 10 to 15 years before that, and it contrasts with the years after that when the growth was much lower at 0.9% and 1% or so. Okay, so those who are the 1990s were special in many ways, uh, and all of the concern that we have right now is about whether we're gonna go back to the period of the 1990s and 3.4% growth, or are we going to go back to what might be a new normal of more 1% growth and 0.9% you know, growth, which is something I'm gonna to speak to. The other very interesting uh, change that happened over the 1990s uh, and 2000s was a changing structure of global supply chains. Okay, so what we have here on this chart is in the bigger the circle, the more central the country is to global supply chain network. And so in 1995, you had that the US was the factory for, the, for North America, Germany was the factory for Europe, and there were a few others. Uh, Japan was the factory for Asia. You don't see much in Latin America there. Okay, so that's kind of what 1995 looked like. And if you look at that same figure in 2011, you see some important changes. No, the U.S. continues to be an important, very central part of the global supply chain network. Europe, you still have Germany as being a very important part of it, but you still now have other countries coming in, especially peripheral uh, Europe. Uh, but the kind of the big change that you see is in the Asia region. So what you see there is you see that the circle for Japan kind of shrinks some, and you have the increase in the size of China in the global supply chain network, which is not, this is exactly what we've all uh, known and heard and seen the China taking over more and more of world trade. So China comes in there, you see Korea, South Korea also growing in size, you see India's contribution coming in, not as much as China and South Korea, but comes in. So on the Asia Pacific side, you certainly had a shift away from Japan's centrality to the kind of more of East Asia, China, India, and, and those countries. So this is the kind of trend that we've known. We've seen that there's been a move away. There's a shift eastwards in terms of some of these, uh, some of the, the, the production networks that we have. Uh, and some of the slowing of trade that happened post-2015 was because of slowing of growth in China, 
and the slowing of the production network and the global value chains in, in China. The other interesting shift that we saw was that in some areas of manufacturing, so for instance in computing and electronics manufacturing, we had again a shift east, eastwards in the global supply chain. So the red circles tell you parts of the world that basically lost their centrality, kind of shrunk in terms of their centrality uh, in the production of computing and electronics, in the manufacturing of, of computing and electronics. Uh, and the green circles are the ones that gained, right? And so you can see that the US lost, a lot of uh, Western Europe lost. Uh, and the greens are mostly China, Korea, uh, and those parts of the world, uh, Japan lost, Malaysia gained. And so we had a shift in the manufacturing uh, supply chain away from the US and from Germany uh, towards, uh, uh, towards China and Korea. Now, this doesn't, I'm not saying that the US and Germany don't have a central law. They continue to do so because they started off with a very high base. But this is basically saying that they've lost in relative to where they stood in 1995. Okay, so all of this has been great um, from a trade perspective. This is what we saw. But alongside seeing these shifts away from the so-called advanced economies to the uh, more developing emerging markets, a trend that we also observed was rising income inequality. Okay, now it just so happened that hap that also happens around the same time. This big increase in inequality at the top 1% goes up in the 1990s. Um, and while you can't make a causal inference and say, well, this is because we had all of this trade liberalization and because of all of these, uh, you know, changing global supply chains, that's the reason we had this increase in inequality. There's no causal link there. But that's what people have stared at and have, that, has, that has triggered a lot of concern in the world economy about the role globalization has played. Um, What's very interesting is that if you look at kind of the work that's been done into trying to understand how much of that rise of in increasing in, in income inequality comes from trade as opposed to technology and automation, the split is closer to 30%, 70%. So 30% is trade, 70% is technology and automation is responsible for this rising in income inequality. But that's not what the narrative is. The narrative tends to be more that 70 is blamed on globalization and 30% automation. So that has shown up in, uh, in discussions of, uh, in impressions. I mean, that's exactly what's whipped up a lot of trade discontent. What you see there is uh, a survey by the Pew uh, Research Institute uh, where they survey people around the globe and ask them their views on trade. Uh, and so this is a picture, this is a survey that was done in 2014. And what you see there is you know, three, four, three questions. Does trade create jobs? Do you believe trade creates jobs? Do you believe trade raises w wages? Uh, do you believe foreign acquisitions are good? And what you see there is a very interesting panel. Firstly, developing countries and emerging markets think that trade is good much more than advanced economies do. And the weakest is the U.S. So the, we, the, the opinion for trade from the, from the U.S. is weaker than, than advanced economies as a whole. Okay, so there's no U.S. in that advanced economies bar. So that's just the U.S. is just the, the weakest you've seen. And then actually if you see the sur survey over time, you see that this impression has changed and gotten this divergence between the U.S. and the rest of the world, and especially emerging and developing markets, has grown over time. Right? So there's clearly a sense in which there is the advanced economies of the world feel very strongly that, uh, and the people in the advanced economies of the world feel very strongly that they've lost in the whole globalization, uh, uh, you know, the globalization that's happened in the world. Developing countries and emerging uh, economies, especially China, have gained at the expense of American workers, and again, in terms of jobs, in terms of wages. Okay, so again, let me just remind you that this doesn't tell you that this is this doesn't tell you that this is that globalization is to blame. And like I said, the facts are more that it's 30% globalization and 70% automation. But this is what the narrative is, and this kind of is what's going to uh, impact the way uh, we think trade liberalization is going to, is going to proceed uh, in the future. <clears throat> 
Okay, so with that, uh, with this trade discontent, with the fact that people have connected uh, globalization and trade to rising inequality, and I'm not saying that trade has not, has no, doesn't take any blame at all, or globalization doesn't take any blame at all, it does, uh, but not of the magnitude that people have attributed to it. We are now, and if we look at the, the first three, the three factors that drove the booming period of the 1990s and, and globalization and trade, we kind of lost two of the three, okay? So we've lost in terms of, uh, there is a sense in which we are no longer going to be writing those big trade agreements. We're not going to be having a uh, push towards more trade liberalization. At least that's the sense we have. Uh, we certainly are not in a world of very favorable political developments for, tra for international trade. And then I'm going to say just a little bit of the information and communication technology revolution. So, you know, it's absolutely the case that if you look at the contribution of IT to productivity growth in the US and in the world, the peak was in the 1990s. It has slowed down now. So there is more revolution happening. There is more uh, innovation happening. There is more research happening. Not of the magnitude that happened in the 1990s. And its marginal contribution to productivity has, has come down. Okay. So, Kind of in all three factors, we are in a bit of a lull at this point in time. So the question is, and it's very important to us, and now we're going to switch to thinking about what's happening for the future. But again, I'm bringing this slide up over here, which is that when people talk about the globalization versus nationalism, uh, uh, are, we, are we, is globalization in retreat? They kind of point to the most recent trade intensity numbers. And they say, well, if you look at the trade intensity, uh, it's come down. Uh, it's now 1.2%, 1 1.1% 1 .1%, uh, per annum uh, in the most recent decade as compared to 3.4% in the period of the 1990s where things were great. Uh, and so this is what you would point to and you say, well, you know, do we have to now worry because this is a retreat of globalization? Okay, so the first thing I want you to keep in mind and to take away is the fact that the 1990s was special was special in many ways. It was special compared to the peri periods of the 60s and the 70s. It was, and therefore, in some sense, kind of what's more surprising is to ask, you know, what happened in the 1990s that we need to replicate? So now we could be moving more to the new normal, and I'm going to talk about that. So that's the future. So we, let's think about where we are headed, uh, given where we, we're coming from. Uh, so protectionism, firstly. I think there is a bit of a disconnect between the rhetoric and the facts. Okay, so yes, it's true. There is a lot of talk about protectionism. There is, you know, we, there's no reason to be complacent and think that that will not come about. But if you look at where the facts are right now, we are not seeing any serious reversal in globalization. So if you think, for me, a reversal in globalization would be a reversal in permanent tariffs, you are not seeing that. What you do see as an, is an increase in non-tariff barriers, but that basically covers 2% of world trade, so it's tiny. So what explains the slowing trade intensity? Like what explains that previous figure uh, we had there of slowing trade intensity, including that dip that we had in the peak of the crisis of 2008, 2009? The more important factor is two things. One. It is economic, it's a slowdown in economic activity and in investment. So 80% of the slowing down in world trade and world trade intensity, uh, the whole dip that happened in the middle of the financial crisis is explained just from an accounting perspective is explained by the fact that there's been, there's slower economic activity in the world economy. And secondly, Importantly, that there has been a decline in investment rates around the world. Now, investment is crucial to trade because trade is basically takes place in, uh, in goods and intermediate inputs that usually feed into investment. So there's a very close link between investment and uh, trade as opposed to consumption and trade. So even though consumption has recovered in many parts of the world, the fact that investment continues to stay pretty weak uh, is the reason why trade intensity has come down. So that slowing has nothing to do, has very little to do with protectionism or very little to do with slowing value-added chains. 
but a lot more to do with uh, the general health of the global economy. So we had the first period of 2008 or 9 and the first few years surrounding that when uh, it was all about the post-financial crisis slowdown, the kind of the, the weakening of, uh, of demand all over the world. And then you had the commodity price collapse, and you had a collapse in growth in emerging markets. You have China that's going from 10% growth rates to 6% growth rates. All of that feeds into lower trade intensity, because these were countries that were growing based on investment, based on infrastructure investment. That's what feeds into trade, and that's what was partly responsible for the booming trade intensity that we observed in, uh, in the 1990s. So that's, that has come down. So that's my first take, is that what we've seen in protectionism is mostly, at this point, rhetoric and uh, less based on facts. Okay, so what can we say? So if, given this view that I have that growth really matters for what we're going to see in terms of trade, international trade, and economic linkages, I think it's important to think about what we think is the new normal for growth in the world economy. And the second is what do we think is the new normal for trade policy? Right? Both of these factors are going to feed into how much, of, how much we can have in terms, of, uh, in terms of globalization. Both of these are more growth, more trade policies would be good for globalization. So we have to see how these two factors play out. OK, so let's look at the first factor, which is the new normal for growth. Uh, so the table there tells you the growth rate, uh, annual growth rates in the world, for the world as a whole, for advanced economies, for emerging markets. So we think pre-crisis 2005, the world economy was growing at 4.9%. Uh, advanced economies were growing at 2.8%. And emerging markets, mainly driven by China, was growing at 7.2%. Actually, you know, the US starts slowing down way before the crisis. So the US's turning point is 2003, for when its growth starts slowing down. So in fact, if you go back a few more years for the US, you'd get to about 3% growth rates. Then you look at 2016, and so this is uh, the number we have from the International Monetary Fund for 2016 for the world, 3.1% for the world economy, 1.7% for advanced economies, 4.1% for emerging markets. And then you have the projection for 2018, and the projection for 2018 is that the world economy will grow at 3.6%, advanced economies at 1.9%, emerging markets at 4.8%. OK, so what this tells us is, that, and this is true even for the projections for 2019 and 2020. Not that the IMF gets its projections right. In fact, they do kind of badly in their projections. But that said, I think that this is, there is a general consensus that uh, the world has now moved away from the booming years of the 1990s and the early 2000s when you had very high growth rates in the emerging markets and in advanced economies. And we've now moved down to what seems like more of a new normal, where advanced economies might be growing at 1% to 2%. Uh, emerging markets, with China slowing down, and you know, while India is coming in, it's, it's going to take a long time before it's able to fill the space that, uh, that China has, has, uh, has left. So it's, about four, it's going to be around 4 to 5%. So the world economy is growing at about two, one or two percentage points below the peak of the 1990s. OK, so that itself tells you that there is, in terms of what we're going to see in terms of globalization, the fact that we're going to see lowering trade intensities does not mean that there's necessarily higher protectionism, but it's also a symbol of, of where we think growth is going. Now, every, there is the holy grail for everybody trying to figure out where is growth going to come from. Uh, and I think that's where people like you can step in. But, but that's the question is, what is going to bring back the productivity growth of the 1990s? The 1990s was special in terms of productivity growth. And, and unless you can figure out where that productivity growth comes from, that's the million dollar question at this point. Uh, that's what's going to make globalization look more attractive to the world. That's what's going to make trade look more attractive to the rest of the world. So the next picture there is for in investment. And as you can see, this is the point I made earlier which is this is just an index of investment for the world economy and for the world excluding China. And you can see that the dashed line, which is, which is 
the world excluding China, you see that investment dropped in the crisis and never recovered back to its original level. So you've had weak levels of investment. China has been doing a lot of spending on investment, so including China, the world doesn't look so bad. But if you exclude China, well, the world economy is doing quite poorly in terms of investment. And this is, again, now tied back to this question of what are the sources of productivity that we expect to see. And if investment looks like that, trade is also going to look weak, because that's, again, a very tight link between trade uh, and investment. The other new normal for growth is, I think, the immense policy uncertainty, especially in the near term. Uh, and I see three big sources of, of policy uncertainty. One is on the, fisc on the US side, on US fiscal reform and regulatory reform. Uh, I think it's completely unclear what policies are going to take place. There were discussions of having a corporate tax cut with border adjustment taxes. You can see how embedded globalization is and how hard it is for globalization to go back by the fact that you, you know, BAT is not on the table anymore. It's not something that, they, that the administration thinks that they can actually pass through. So if you know the border adjustment tax was the tax that said that you, know, you could not exclude imported inputs from your revenues when you calculate corporate profit taxes, uh, and your export revenues were exempt. So there was enough backlash from retailers uh, in the US that basically makes this, uh, makes this off the table. So this kind of tells you that it's, it's so embedded that you know, given the work that you all do and given the kind of supply chain networks we have in the world, it's very hard to roll back uh, globalization. The second, for me, the big concern is what's going to happen with Brexit negotiations and the outcome associated with that. They certainly voted themselves out of the European Union. I don't think they have a clue about what they actually want to do in terms of uh, what, kind of, what kind of package they want to have with, with uh, the EU and with the rest of the world. So this is highly uncertain, and that's a very important, uh, and the UK is an important part of the global uh, supply chain. And the third big factor from a global economy perspective is the financial risks in China. You know, with China having the economy as a whole, having debt to GDP of about 250%, there is this continuous concern. I mean, we, everything, every indicator, every financial risk indicator always points that if you're going to have a rapid increase in debt of the kind that China has, you're headed for a financial crisis. And so this is a big red flag. Uh, and if there's a financial crisis in China, it affects the world as a whole. We know that even if, you know, it used to be that when uh, the US falls sick, everybody else does too. But now I think it's true even that if China falls sick, the world does too. Uh, and so, and it's not just for China's spillover to the U.S., but it's also China's spillover to regionally and all the global supply chains that we have over there. So those are the three uh, policy uncertainty factors that we have. So once we, once we accept that, the combination that we don't have seem to have the best ideas in terms of great raising productivity, the fact that there is still tremendous policy uncertainty, that we're not able to revive investment, all of these point to... Uh, the new normal of growth, which is not the kind that we observed in the 1990s when trade was at its peak. The second, the new normal for trade policy. I showed you that trade liberalization has kind of peaked at this point. We've, our average tariff rates are about 4%, less than 4% at this point. So trade liberalization has slowed, and it slowed way before the financial crisis. So it slowed around starting 2002. We've just had fairly inconclusive rounds of negotiations of the WTO. Uh, second, because we've kind of attacked the low-hanging fruit, the new trade agreements are going to be far more contentious, right? They get into territories like intellectual property rights, they get into territories like harmonization, regulatory standards, investment dispute settlement, who's going to set, who's, you know, who do you empower with, dis with settling disputes in countries? The last holdout for tariffs is agriculture, so that would be the area where they could, you could have uh, some change. But these are highly contentious topics. As you can see, they, Im they impinge on sovereignty issues for countries uh, in terms of, say, investment dispute settlement. So in negotiations of this kind are going to be far more contentious. It's not clear we're going to have easy victories and, and low-hanging fruit. And the third is that automation will continue. There will continue to be artificial intelligence, robotics, replacing workers and replacing jobs, which means that automation will continue to scapegoat trade. Right? If we believe that it is that every lost job is because of international trade, 
we are going to have a lot of lost jobs. We're going to have a lot of jobless growth. And that's, again, going to feed back into trade. So the prognosis for trade policy, because you know, we're out of the low-hanging fruit, uh, and because of the fact that we will continue to have uh, a lot of growth without job creation, I think that the prognosis of trade policy is also quite weak. So, so even if, so this is kind of my view, is that even if there isn't any change, dramatic change in, uh, in, in trade policy, even if there isn't, uh, you know, something crazy of like a country pulling out of WTO, and I won't name any country, uh, the, you know, you can't, it's not as if we're sitting at a point where there are a lot of low-hanging fruit to be gained in terms of policy making in, in, in trade. Okay, now that said, the world is moving on. So certainly the, the, the US is no longer the, uh, the champion of world trade, uh, but it seems like the rest of the world seems to want to now jump in and fill that role in. If they're not making the best deals, they want to make some deals, right? And so you have many uh, trade negotiations uh, taking place, so I think there's going to be a shift in the, uh, where all the action is in terms of trade negotiations away from the US to Europe, to Japan, so you have the Japanese-EU Economic Partnership Agreement, the EU-Canada Trade Agreement, the TPP, the 11, the 12 would have been the US, but now it's just 11, um, regional comprehensive economic partnership in Asia. So these policies are being pushed, again, for the reasons that I mentioned before, that the big gains in liberalization are going to happen if there's going to be harmonization of standards and things like that. And that's going to be much, much uh, slower. Even none of these agreements have been able to push through anything uh, on that front. OK. Uh, so in the last few minutes that I have, I'm going to talk about China and India, given that I just said that we're moving away from uh, you know, where the, the leaders of trade and globalization uh, are uh, the US uh, and Europe, but it's going to be more uh, developing economies just because there's a lot of political appetite for it at this point too. Uh, when I was at Davos, we had Xi Jinping who gave the address over there, and if you close your eyes, you would have thought it was Obama speaking because he was all about uh, how trade is wonderful and fantastic and it's important for, for the world to, uh, to, to embrace uh, uh, trade. So this is where we're going. So let me give you my quick take on China and India. So firstly, China and India are, you know, I like to put, I mean, I'm a big champion of India, so I like to put India next to China all the time. But, you know, they are not comparable. We're looking at China, $11 trillion economy. India is a true trillion dollar economy. So I think of India as the kind of the upstart, the emerging market upstart at this point in time. Uh, China is, has, kind of used up its very high growth rates. Uh, it's now slowing down. But China is the one with the true, with the true young potential. It is a younger e uh, economy in terms of its demographics. It has a very young population, uh, unlike China. Uh, India and China's growth rates are quite similar at this point in time, but everything points to India growing at much faster rates than China, which it should do when you compare an $11 trillion economy to a $2 trillion economy. Uh, both these are big destinations for FDI. India took over as having, being the number one de destination for foreign direct investment. Uh, China is ranked number two. It was number one for the longest time. The U.S. is number three. Um, so this, you know, so, so there is a lot of potential for India. So for, if I want to give my pitch for India, I would say the things that work for India is one, it's still so far below its potential that it has a lot of growth left. You might say to that, well, it's been below its potential for a very long time and nothing has happened. So why now? I think why now? Because there is a government that is incredibly you know, reform-minded. Uh, things don't happen as fast in India as they do in China. Uh, but this is a government that, if ever there was a chance for a government to push through reforms, I think that this government is, is doing that. There's a very good chance this government is going to come back into power in 2019 when the elections come around. So we would have another five years of, of, of similar uh, development. So, and the, you know, it's really fascinating that a lot of policies in terms of privatization, in terms of the goods and ser uh, services tax, uh, which were previously just held up and couldn't, get, couldn't happen, there's actually now a lot of support for it even politically in from, uh, from the people in India. So that's, I think that's the, the, the transformative moment uh, for the country. 
In the case of China, I think what we should pay very close attention to is that you know, we've had these many, many years where the US has led the world economy. It's been uh, not just the, I mean, the US, the International Monetary Fund, the World Bank, all basically you know, funded heavily by the US. These have been the major institutions for globalization, for multilateralism in the world. My prediction is that in the next 10 to 15 years, China is going to want to step in in a big way to take up more of that space. Uh, and the China Belt and Road Initiative is big, it's huge uh, in terms of its ambition. The, the New Development Bank, the Chinese Infrastructure Investment Bank, all of these are uh, initiatives that are meant to rival the, uh, the, the World Bank and the International Monetary Fund. So they're going to try to be much more this, you know, this, uh, the country, the country that takes center stage in the world. Okay, so I'm pretty, I'm out of time. So let me just end over here. So in terms of takeaways, my big three would be one that the question was globalization versus nationalization. I think it's fair to say that globalization is not yet in retreat. There's a lot of rhetoric about it. There is a lot of talk of protectionism. It's not yet in retreat. That said, I don't see the return to the 1990s fantastic rates of globalization and supply chain growth that uh, we had back then, uh, partly because I think that their low-hanging fruit are not there anymore in terms of policy and uh, negotiations. Uh, and I also, I also very strongly believe that for globalization to, to grow, you really do need a lot of, uh, you need healthy economic growth. Uh, and we aren't seeing much of that from uh, many parts of the world. So the new normal for growth and trade intensity uh, is, in my opinion, about 1% to 2%, not like the 1990s, more, more like what it is now. Uh, and I think one should continue to look eastwards in terms of uh, where you think demand is going to come from, where you think your, your production networks are going to be, uh, and where we might see the next big transformation uh, coming uh, in, in the world economy.